one of the major cases I worked on is um, for victims of the drug thalidomide. Thalidomide was a drug available in the UK and around the world between about 1958 and 1962 and it's infamous as the worst medical disaster of all time because it caused thousands and thousands of babies to be born with a varying range of severe birth defects and indeed killed a large number of fetuses before they were ever born. Our case is about um, victims of thalidomide who have been missed for various reasons. Uh, a large number of um, thalidomide victims were compensated in the 1970s, um, but people keep coming forward who, um, for various reasons, either have not realised that their defects were caused by thalidomide, or for various other reasons have not come forward before. And we are bringing a case against the manufacturers um, for those people. And I think it's of really great significance and interest because um, uh, it's going back to a very different time, the 1950s, when things were done very differently um, and learning about how doctors treated um, uh, mother, uh, pregnant women who came, you know, came in complaining of various ailments and the tendency of doctors at the time just to give them a sleeping pill, which is what thalidomide was. Uh, in terms of the impact it's had on um, people's lives, um, I think that, I mean, the case is ongoing, and I think that win or lose is going to have a huge impact on the um, individual claimants' lives. Um, for many, uh, for all of them, I think, um, it's about getting, um, uh, really getting an understanding of what what happened and what caused their, their lives to be um, so dramatically affected. Um, from birth um, by their mother taking this drug. So I think that even for those claimants who lose, um, if indeed any do lose, um, it will have been a process, that, that a cathartic process for them in investigating and taking forward um, uh, a resolution of what happened to them. And for those who are able to win, hopefully all of them, um, it will mean some very substantial compensation which will help them as their conditions deteriorate um, into old age. A uh, final question I was going to address is uh, what changes in civil procedure I would advocate. And the number one change I would advocate for civil procedure is the introduction across the board in the UK of a class action regime. Um, uh, until recently the UK only had a regime of group actions and did not have a class action action regime like in uh, the US, Australia, Canada and other countries. Um, recently the Consumer Rights Act, Act of 2015 introduced a class action regime for competition law cases only. And I'd like to see that um, brought in across the board because the problem with the group action regime is it's very hard to bring claims for large numbers of people who have been, have small losses um, but who may have uh, strong claims and small losses mean individual claims are usually uneconomical. However, a class action regime may, means that a single person can bring claims on behalf of the entire group of affected people and it can uh, therefore make it possible to bring a uh, litigation to fight it properly and gain compensation for a large group of people um, who may only have very small losses. So I was asked to tell you something about how the reforms that have already gone through have impacted on us and the ones that are most significant for us are those which were introduced um, as a result of suggestions made by Lord Justice Jackson and um, they eventually made it into the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012 and then we call that in a catchy phrase LASPO and the two things really were things which affected the no win no fee agreements and the way that those kind of claims operate. Previously, um, the success fee on the conditional fee agreements, the no win, no fee agreements, and the premiums on the insurance were recoverable from the other side if you won. And the changes that were brought in effectively meant that from the 1st of April 2013, um, it was no longer automatic that you would get all of the costs paid by the other side and some of the costs may in some circumstances have to come from the people who had successfully taken the case. And the second main change was that the 
insurance that was taken out by claimants in case they lost and had to pay the other side's costs, that insurance, which previously had normally been paid by the, uh, the party that had lost the case, um, would no longer be paid at all by that party. So those are two potentially quite difficult um, issues for us, given that the vast majority of our cases um, in terms of corporate accountability, cases brought in other jurisdictions are brought on these conditional fee agreements, these no-win, no-fee agreements. It's difficult still, even though those changes came in in 2013, it is actually still quite difficult to assess and to gauge what impact those changes are going to have in, in the long run. Some of those changes are obviously things which we are having to take into account when we're looking at new cases. Um, but I think it's probably too soon to say um, exactly what impact they're going to have in the long run. Um, I think in 2014, uh, Lord Justice Jackson himself wasn't really sure what impact the changes overall uh, were going to have. Um, what we can say is that there's, there's certainly no reduction in the demand for our services, and uh, we're not noticing that um, there is a, a dramatically different way in which we approach those cases. Hi, my name is Paul Dowling. I'm an associate solicitor at Lead A Solicitors in London. Um, I'm going to address uh, a couple of the issues that you've uh, raised, um, the first being um, an important case in which I've been involved, and the second is an area of uh, substantive law uh, that I would uh, choose to change. Um, the case uh, that I've been involved in is um, a c claim on behalf of, uh, it's against a former BP subsidiary um, uh, in relation to alleged damage caused by the construction of an oil pipeline. Uh, we acted on behalf of uh, 73 farm owners, families, um, who alleged that the pipeline had caused wide, widespread damage to their properties. Um, including soil erosion and sedimentation of uh, small streams and water sources on their land. Um, they said this caused uh, losses of income, uh, but also impacted significantly on their traditional way of life. Um, domestic water supplies were allegedly destroyed and land available for crops and grazing was reduced. Um, uh, making subsistence farming less viable for them since this requires large areas for crop rotation and field rotation. Um, the defendants uh, in the case um, argued that any damage on the property was caused by uh, poor farming practices on the part of the claimants, um, including uh, deforestation, overgrazing, and short crop rotation cycles which caused the uh, soil quality to gradually deteriorate. Uh, the defendant also argued that the pipeline was constructed, owned and operated by a Colombian joint venture company, Osensa. Uh, the claimants contended that BP uh, was liable under right-of-way agreements entered into with the farmers um, and that it played a key role in the construction, including commissioning the environmental impact assessment for the project and managing the construction process itself. Now, the judgment in that case is due imminently. So, um, this leads me on to uh, my uh, second issue which I wanted to discuss, which was uh, the area of substantive law that I would choose to change if I could. Um, and the, that area concerns the principle of limited liability and separate corporate personality. Um, now, experience of the BP case, uh, alongside other cases within the department, calls into question, in my view, the continuing appropriateness of the application of the principles of limited liability and separate corporate personality to multinational enterprises and corporate groups in the context of civil claims for damage caused by their overseas operations. The principles of limited liability and separate corporate personality permit uh, multinational enterprises to attempt to outsource risk to separate legal entities, which are often constituted and operating in developing countries with weak institutional structures uh, for the enforcement of individual legal rights. The consequence of this is that multinational enterprises can seek to avoid liability 
by attributing responsibility to locally constituted companies or by challenging the jurisdiction of the multinational enterprises home court to hear claims involving the actions of their foreign subsidiaries. Now, limited liability is, is a universally recognised and accepted principle which is peculiar in that it grants shareholders unfettered benefits uh, from investment in hazardous activities while shifting the full burden of the risk onto um, in involuntary creditors. And in the context of the type of cases that we run, um, these risks are borne by local, often impoverished uh, communities whose lives have been negatively impacted by the operations of multinationals and who have often experienced very little benefit from uh, those operations. Now, despite the good intentions of uh, uh, Ruggie's UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, which urge multinational enterprises to prevent or mitigate adverse effects, not only of their direct operations, but also those which arise from their business relationships. The unfortunate reality is that when it comes to litigation strategy, such companies operate a no-holds-barred approach in their efforts to avoid liability for the impacts of their overseas activities. In order to address that imbalance, I would advocate a form of enterprise liability which would restrict the capacity of multinational enterprises and corporate groups to take advantage of limited liability and separate corporate personality uh, to avoid responsibility for their operations overseas. Uh, whilst uh, the benefits of limited liability in terms of encouraging private enterprise may be justified in certain circumstances, such considerations clearly do not apply to multinational enterprises and corporate groups acting in furtherance of a common purpose. I'm Sanya Sukovic. I'm an associate in the clinical negligence department at Lead A. Um, what I would say um, has been one of my major five cases um, is a case involving a young woman who sustained profound injuries in the, during the birth of her ch first and only child. Um, she um, was completely incapacitated. Um, she was unable to leave home for a long period of time, had a very long period of medical treatment including a number of um, operations and couldn't really bond with her child. Now when she complained to the hospital, she um, was told that, that's, that nothing had gone wrong, um, things were as they were and it was just one of those very unfortunate things. Um, the reason why this case is important is because it touches upon a number of issues that we as clinical negligence practitioners face. First of all, um, she was told that nothing had gone, had gone wrong and yet um, we um, finally obtained an admission of liability six weeks before trial. This is a case um, which um, also settled two days before trial and it was a case in which the most um, un, um, ridiculous arguments in fact were run, um, therefore driving up cost. Now this also feeds into the next question which is um, how the civil procedural changes will affect our clients. And that is, from a clinical negligence perspective, the introduction of the proposed um, fixed um, recoverable costs regime, which the government says should be introduced in low value claims. Now, these low value claims, according to the government, run to £250,000. Um, by no stretch of the imagination is a case that's valued up to £250,000 a low value claim. Um, cases attracting those damages are those where um, patients have suffered profound injuries, like my client whose claim fell in that bracket. And um, what will happen where, if the fixed recoverable costs are introduced is that there will be an impact on access to justice, um, lay uh, people will be prevented from bringing claims, it will, be, uh, it will prevent people from finding specialist solicitors to act for them and therefore it might impact on, the, um, on there being a likely rise in litigants in person. What it will also mean is, there's no, is there will be a lack of parity between claimants and therefore people who have a high disposable income will be able to choose their legal team, they will be able to choose the experts um, who will act for them, um, whereas those on a low disposable income will have none of those choices because their claims will be affected by, the, um, by their, their earnings and if they have a low disposable income 
um, and they have an injury that is similar to somebody who has a high disposable income, they won't have the same choices, they won't have the same access to specialist solicitors, they will not have the same access to um, specialist experts. What um, changes in civil procedure rules I would advocate also derives from the same case I touched upon earlier, and that is that there should be a requirement in the CPR for the defendants to be obliged to obtain expert evidence prior to filing their defence. All too often we are faced with cases where a defence is being pleaded without the benefit of expert evidence, at least in causation, um, therefore driving up costs, driving up the um, issues that have to be determined and also impacting upon the um, final resolution of the claim but also the claimant's ability to move on with their lives and that has to be changed. The claimant investigates their case, the claimant serves a letter of claim after a proper investigation and the particulars of claim are served after a further investigation with a consideration of the letter of response. So why the defendant should not be obliged to obtain, to obtain expert evidence and serve a defence with that benefit, I don't understand. And this question is on the impact of employment tribunal fees. And there's been a startling decline in the number of employees bringing claims in the employment tribunal um, since the government decided to implement a system of fees back in 2013. Statistics published in September last year show that whereas in 2012 to 2013 there were around 50,000 claims on average per quarter, in the following year this number would drop by half whereas the year after that, so 2014 to 2015, there were around 70% less claims in the employment tribunal. Women and low paid workers, we have found, have been the most affected by the introduction of fees in the employment tribunal. There's been an, a reported 80% fall of sex discrimination claims and around a 85% drop in unpaid wages claims. The statistics for us, we find, were highly predictable. Women are more likely to pay, work in low paid part time roles, which means that the fees are even less affordable to them. Lee Day are currently representing thousands of women in claims against Asda and Sainsbury's for equal pay, and these claims are being brought on a no win no fee basis. The women that we're representing have found that there isn't a way for them otherwise to be able to bring the claims. The UK government did announce a review back in 2015 of the fee system. This was long overdue as it should have been implemented around 12 months after the introduction of the fees. As it stands at the moment, the outcome of this review hasn't been published, but we hope that they may be influenced by the Scottish um, government, who in 2015 included a promise within their programme for government, where they said that they are going to look at abolishing fees in the employment tribunal. Some of the other things that we've also found um, is how employers are trying to use the new system to their advantage. So for example, we've seen examples of employers where they are refusing to engage in early conciliation or refusing to discuss settlement because they're basically taking an approach where they're calling the claimants bluff and waiting to see whether they actually do put their money where their mouth is and pay the employment tribunal fees before deciding to go ahead with the claim. Similarly, they are finding that they're entering into settlement agreements that are much more favourable to them given that claimants are much more likely to settle at an early stage so that they can avoid paying the fees. All of this really does severely impact on access to justice, particularly for those who are vulnerable and the poor in our society.